Hello, and welcome to this virtual Playbook Live interview uh, with Ambassador Wolfgang Ischinger. My name is Florian Eder. I'm the author of Politico's uh, Brussels Playbook, our morning email. And it is my great pleasure today uh, to talk to Wolfgang Ischinger, who is uh, the chairman, of course, as you all know, of the Munich Security Conference uh, since 2008, is a former diplomat and uh, senior diplomat and official in the German Foreign Office as an ambassador to London and Washington, among other places, of course, and uh, uh, an eminent expert uh, commentator and, of course, chief convener of the community uh, dealing with foreign and security policy uh, and all things transatlantic and, uh, and European affairs. So welcome, uh, Wolfgang Ischinger, uh, my great pleasure. Uh, welcome to all of you uh, who follow this conversation today on Zoom and on other platforms. Um, uh, just some uh, short housekeeping remarks before we, before we start. Uh, this is uh, our third virtual playbook uh, interview like this, and there will be more, of course. So I will ask you in the end to send your feedback so we can make things even better and more interesting for you. If you've got questions, we would like to come to your questions during, uh, during this conversation. Please use the Q&A tool in Zoom and do not use any other uh, platforms as I won't be able to monitor uh, them all. So Q&A in Zoom and not to chat and not Twitter. Um, and if you want to tweet about this uh, conversation, please use the hashtag Politico Ischinger uh, and tag at Politico events, our, our event people, so uh, uh, we can um, uh, follow and moderate this conversation. Again, welcome, Wolfgang Ischinger. It is my great pleasure. Uh, and let's just start, I would say, uh, as there are there is no better time uh, to talk about, uh, uh, to talk with you, um, as we've had a, a new proposal yesterday, a joint Franco-German proposal by uh, Chancellor Merkel and French President Emmanuel Macron, who proposed a huge 500 billion fund of, for recovery for European countries um, that is, of course, a lot of money and you can buy a lot of things uh, with uh, 500 billion euro. My question to you would be uh, on a slightly uh, uh, different aspect of this. Is this, you think, uh, a game changer in European integration that we, for the first time, have uh, countries and Germany in particular uh, agree uh, to joint debt issuance on European level? Uh, hello, uh, Florian, and, and, and welcome to all those who are watching and or listening. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you on this uh, on this program. Uh, well, yes, indeed, I think this is a major moment. Uh, I hope it's not an exaggeration to think of it as a transformative moment. I forget whether it was Winston Churchill or Ram Emanuel, uh, Obama's former chief of staff, who said, uh, never waste a crisis. And uh, as I look at the European Union, we have had for the last uh, decade a European Union beset by crisis, beset by existential angst, uh, beset by fragmentation. Uh, let's think of Brexit and other issues that are currently endangering the existence of the European Union. And therefore, it was not an exaggeration to speak of uh, the current challenge the pandemic challenge as really a question of survival of the European Union. And I think what we saw yesterday was the acknowledgement by Emmanuel Macron and by my chancellor, by Angela Merkel, uh, of the fact that this situation is serious. It is an existential challenge and existential challenges require extraordinary measures and this is why they took this step, which is unprecedented, which takes us into, I would think, into a new chapter of the European Union. Now, uh, let me only add one uh, note of, of caution. Um, a a Franco-German agreement about, you know, uh, this kind of sum of money uh, does not mean that it's all done and agreed. These are two countries out of 27, and uh, everybody knows that there are countries who will be happy, happily welcoming uh, this, um, uh, uh, th th these news, 
But there are also obviously uh, a number of member countries who will have uh, issues. So this is the beginning of a process. But what I do believe is that without, and this has been the case when I joined uh, diplomacy 40 years ago, without Franco-German agreement, it's very difficult to get anything done in the European Union. With people always say it is not enough, of course, but uh, it, is a, it is a necessary precondition to have. It's a necessary precondition and it creates a little bit of, uh, of, of energy, of, of impulse, and it will make the work for the commission, for Ursula von der Leyen and, and, and her commission, hopefully a little easier in putting, putting the details on this program and coming up with something that all 27 can agree. So I think it's a, it's a really good move yesterday i welcome it i applaud it and i hope it will uh, it will work let me come to uh, you just mentioned uh, the commission and, and ursula von der leyen uh, whose life you said uh, is going to be a bit easier there's also people who uh, uh, who say and one could argue uh, you know this is the core uh, uh, task of the european of the european commission to come up with the next european budget now, uh, uh, Germany and France, Paris and Berlin have taken over uh, and proposed, uh, you know, the major uh, uh, outlines, not only of the next European uh, seven-year budget, but also of, of the one after that, when they say that, you know, this, uh, the grants will be paid back uh, over the course of, of way more than, than just seven years. So are we back again to uh, a state uh, where uh, the European Commission is the secretariat of the, of the council or of the big EU capitals? I don't think so. I think when you look at what uh, both uh, Chancellor Merkel and uh, President Macron said in their press uh, conference yesterday, uh, they really, what they're saying is, uh, well, we kick the ball into the field for the European Commission, but it's now for the EU Commission, for Ursula von der Leyen and, 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 and her commission, uh, to kick it into the goal. In other words, to uh, complete the work, to put the finishing touches on it. It's not that Germany and France are claiming that they know how to do it and they, are, they have actually not proposed a finalized detailed plan. They have uh, prepared a fundamental agreement uh, which could be, uh, serve as a basis. So I think this is a good division of, of, of labor and a recognition of the special responsibility which large member countries like Germany as the biggest contributor and a very important country like France, which is a member of the permanent members of the UN Security Council and the nuclear power, they have a responsibility which uh, they are acknowledging and that's good. There is, there was often talk that uh, Emmanuel Macron extended a hand uh, to Germany and to Chancellor Merkel in particular personally already a few years ago and nobody ever uh, uh, bothered could be bothered to answer him. Is this, uh, in your view, now the finally and eventually the German answer to, uh, to Macron's offer? Well, it's at least uh, a step. I'm not sure it's the, you know, the, the, the comprehensive answer to the proposals that Macron made. But look, yesterday, Chancellor Merkel hinted at the fact that this was only going to be the beginning, that there were there is more to come there. She even mentioned the possibility or, or the perspective of treaty changes. Yeah. And, and quite frankly, I think that's where the European Union needs to go with or without treaty changes. We need to, to trans, transform, to reprioritize the European Union. And that is what Emmanuel Macron said almost three years ago. Um, from a European Union which regulates, which organizes life within the European Union. We need to transform this European Union into a European Union which can protect, une Europe qui protège, as Macron said, protecting the member countries against military threats, against uh, terrorism, protecting the citizens against trans transnational crime, et cetera, et cetera. I think this kind of capability, capacity building for the European Union to defend uh, the citizens and the member countries in a globalized world which has been described as, you know, the jungle growing back. Um, 
American friend of mine, uh, Bob, Bob Kagan, wrote a book uh, about that. The Jungle Growing Back, the International uh, Liberal Order Fragmenting, a great power rivalries erupting all over the place. So we need a European Union that can protect and defend our interests. And I think this is and was yesterday a good step in the right direction, but only the beginning. A lot more needs to come. One more uh, question on this. Chancellor Merkel, as you, as you mentioned, uh, uh, talked about treaty change yesterday and last week already in the Bundestag, she mentioned uh, that the, you know, the ultimate goal uh, has to be a political union. Do you think that other uh, big EU countries, uh, such as France uh, and Italy uh, and Spain and you know them all, uh, are ready to go uh, uh, um, you know, to follow her uh, on this way? Because it means, of course, not only uh, that you give something, but also that you uh, yeah, give up on, on certain sovereignties, such as how to spend uh, uh, national budgets um, if we move into a direction where not only that is, uh, is collectivized, uh, but also, as the Germans always say, the responsibility uh, is, uh, is being brought to European level. Is that something that you see great chances of, uh, of ever happening in the course of uh, the foreseeable future? Well, look, I mean, for the last 40, 50 years, all, uh, the, uh, all the moves forward, all the initiatives that took the European Union from the original uh, community to the Lisbon Treaty, all of these moves forward were beset with trouble and with difficulties and with backlashes, etc. So somebody has got to, uh, to have the courage and, and start a process, initiate a, 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 uh, initiate a process, make a proposal. I'll give you one example, uh, Florian. If we want, and I think that is what Macron and Merkel want, and I'm sure that is what most of the other uh, leaders in the European Union would also like to see. If we want the European Union uh, representing 450 million voters, citizens, uh, and representing 27 member countries, if we want to be capable of playing a role in this uh, jungle that is growing back, we need to be able to speak with one voice, not only on trade and agriculture, but on foreign policy and security policy. And that inevitably will need, uh, will require for the European Council to start a discussion about introducing majority voting in foreign policy. That is revolutionary. Some member states will resent this and will oppose it because for them, this is the, 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 the center piece of, of sovereignty. But I think that if we mean what we say, that we want the European Union to be able to protect us, we need to take steps in this direction. And we can't expect Portugal, Greece, Estonia, and other small member countries to take such initiatives. I think it's the responsibility of larger uh, member states to, to present such proposals. And I would hope that my own government would, would uh, have the courage and uh, start a discussion uh, about how we can, maybe in a step-by-step -step process, uh, introduce majority voting. That would seriously enhance the capacity of the European Union to play a role internationally and have a, we will have a voice that will be respected. That is also something, by the way, that Jean-Claude Juncker, the former commission president, uh, 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 a phrase that Jean-Claude Juncker coined when he, when he spoke in Munich at a security conference, the, the famous uh, term of Weltpolitikfähigkeit that is so hard to translate into English. Um, um, do you think, uh, last question on, on this really, uh, that all this new uh, impetus for uh, deeper integration, be it uh, on the recovery front, be it on what you just mentioned, is something that Angela Merkel wants to uh, be part of her legacy when it comes to European affairs? Well, I, you know, I think that, uh, of course, no one was happy when this pandemic crisis started. But it's, it's really interesting to see that uh, in, in my country, in, in Germany, the popularity of the current chancellor, which was not exactly at a high point a year ago, uh, she was still uh, struggling in terms of her popularity, 
in terms of public acceptance with the fallout from the refugee uh, and migration crisis. But at this moment, she is at an almost all-time high. Uh, and I think that it, in terms of the, the, the possibilities for her to come up with a meaningful EU presidency in the second half of this year uh, and preparing the European Union for the future together with France and hopefully uh, a significant number of other forward-leaning uh, member states. The chances of doing that have enormously improved. So once again, let me say that I think Chancellor Merkel has very well understood, never waste a crisis. Let's do what is possible now under crisis conditions and what may have, what, what would not have been possible under normal circumstances, not with the German Bundestag uh, and its, its skepticism regarding budgetary outlays, et cetera, et cetera. But these are extraordinary times and they require extra nor, extraordinary answers. So I think, yes, chances are that uh, Chancellor Merkel will seize this opportunity hopefully sees it successfully and uh, walk out of the chancellery uh, as she has announced uh, toward the end of next year uh, with, a with a legacy that will be seen as a success story. Let me come to a uh, first question from our audience here because it's on the thing that we uh, are discussing right now. There's a question from Carlo Brenner. I don't understand, I'm reading it out, I don't understand this emphasis on the Franco-German proposal. Uh, it's an important sign, um, uh, but isn't it just the, uh, the proposal that the Commission was preparing anyways? Uh, and uh, second part of the question, uh, am I, uh, we, as for the recovery fund, we were talking about two trillion and now we're all excited about 500 billion. Is that uh, some, uh, some, some border into, into the wine? Is, that, is there something that you would like to say on that? Well, I would not want to, uh, you know, exaggerate the, the relevance of yesterday's decision, but let's also not, um, uh, not minimize it. Uh, it, uh, it is a meaningful step when Germany and France on an issue that has been hotly debated, namely the budgetary situation of the European Union and how uh, we can move forward. If Germany and France can um, find agreement, propose it, and 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 throw it into the uh, in, into the basket of the of the EU uh, Commission, I think this is uh, meaningful. This is uh, uh, I, I I can see that the Prime Minister of Spain has already welcomed this. Uh, we have had positive responses from Italy. There are also some skeptical voices. This is only the beginning of a debate. Uh, the Franco-German proposal, again, is a proposal of two member states, but two important member states. Uh, this is not a decision yet uh, of all the 27. A lot of hard work will have to go into that. But chances are that the commission will now be able to move forward, supported by these two, uh, and I think this improves the chances of a success um, uh, in, in coming weeks and, 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 the, and the good basis for the German EU presidency, presidency which starts in, in, only, in only, you know, seven weeks or so, six weeks or so. We'll come to that in a minute. First, one more question here uh, on the Franco-German uh, couple or axis or uh, 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 well couple as, uh, as the French say do you think that the European Commission can take vigorous steps on European defense or will this remain in the hands of, uh, of, of France and Germany and is there a realistic chance of progress uh, well, as long as uh, member states keep their hand in PESCO and so on well let me, let me be very brief on that first of all for many years uh, all the EU had to say was to blow off hot air about defense, but nothing really happened. And it, it, and it, 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 took, uh, it took many years uh, until the European Union took concrete steps. We now have a number of programs. We have the European Defense Fund with PESCO. Uh, we, we, I don't even want to go through the long list of, of issues and initiatives. I think this is the good, this is a necessary step in creating the necessary capacity to act for the European Union. But 
it should, and I'm addressing myself in particular to those from the Anglo-Saxon world, it should never be interpreted as a step away from NATO. Uh, we cannot, speaking as a German, we cannot defend Germany militarily without NATO, without the nuclear guarantee, as long as there are nuclear threats uh, uh, out there in, in, in the jungle. Um, so supplementing uh, the NATO defense arrangement by creating a, a greater capacity to act in crisis situations for the European Union, that's the way forward. And I, I think we are on the, on the right track. Sometimes I wish we could move forward more quickly, um, but uh, a, a beginning has been made and I strongly support uh, the steps that have been undertaken. One last question on, on this uh, complex. Uh, do you think German, uh, it's here from Hideaki, uh, do you think German public opinion is on board with, uh, you know, the new integration steps, the, the recovery fund, uh, the money being spent? Well, I would have had some hesitations responding to this, to your question, if uh, I hadn't seen uh, earlier this morning uh, positive, uh, supportive responses from uh, Chancellor Merkel's own parliamentary group, the CDU, CSU group in the Bundestag. They are the ones who really matter. If they had hesitations about this program, uh, I think we would, we, we might really have a problem. But they've come out, uh, they've come out in favor. So I think that Germany is lucky to have an, an overwhelmingly strong uh, public support uh, for the European Union. I think it's still more than two thirds, it's probably more like three, uh, three fourths of, of the population that is pro-European. What worries me more uh, than support for the EU is the fact that when I look at recent polling data, uh, that our uh, citizens seem not to understand the difference between the United States and China. There is now growing support uh, for, for China and uh, a tremendous uh, a lack of, 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 of uh, support and of, of positive outcomes in our relationship with the United States. That is extremely worrisome and that is something that needs to be addressed in coming weeks, months and years. You are referring, uh, among others, uh, to a very new poll that is out yesterday evening or this morning in the newspapers from the, the Kerber Foundation that actually sees that the proportion of, of Germans um, uh, uh, who think that the US are a more important partner than China is, is shrinking over time and is, uh, and is actually, uh, the level is actually very, very low. Is that um, um, a direct outcome and impact of the handling of this health crisis uh, in both China and, and the US, in your view? Well, not only. I think we have had um, an increasing irritation, by the way, not only in Germany, also in most other uh, EU member countries, about the Trump administration. The fact that the Trump administration walked away from the JCPOA, from the Iran nuclear agreement, for example. The fact that the Trump administration walked away from the Paris climate uh, uh, agreement, etc., uh, etc. Et the fact that uh, uh, the Trump administration is now threatening to uh, actually walk away from WHO at a moment when the WHO is more needed by the global community than at any moment in history before. I think this worries uh, Germans and they, they have doubts about the reliability uh, of this current US uh, administration. China, uh, on the contrary, uh, has actually done quite well in public relations. I'm not going to defend the Chinese track record uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the pandemic crisis and in terms of the more uh, aggressive uh, behavior of Chinese diplomacy in recent months. It's for the Chinese themselves to decide whether that's going to be a success story vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Europeans and, and, and others. But I'm not surprised 
that uh, the polling data seem to suggest that Germans uh, feel relatively comfortable at the moment with the relationship with China. Germans know that uh, the German export industry, which is so essential to our well-being, to our prosperity, depends to a significant extent on, uh, on our trade with and our investments in China. So yeah, uh, they feel comfortable. Uh, uh, and I think it's, an, it's going to require an effort by government and by parliament to explain that, yes, we have a significant number of issues with China uh, that are very, very different from those that we have with our partner, the United States. So making sure that people understand the difference between a, uh, a democracy, a partner that is currently uh, going through some difficulties, let me put it that way, the United States, that is one story, and dealing with a, uh, with a, uh, a growing global power like China that is not a democracy, that is uh, governed by uh, the Communist Party of China, that is a totally different, uh, different relationship. And we need to uh, have a transparent and open discussion about how to deal with both, cha both challenges. They're both challenges, but it, it, in, in very different ways. What is the, the challenge for you, uh, you know, the, the United States better than, than most people? Uh, is that uh, only campaign related? Uh, what we see currently also tonight's announcement that you mentioned uh, that the Trump administration threatens to, you know, to make it perp, to make its walk away from WHO permanent. Is that something that we would see uh, uh, at the same point in time next year, uh, should President Trump win uh, the re-election, or is that something that is goes deeper and is actually worrisome, as you said, not only to Germans but also to yourself? Well, I, you know, I think that uh, we have an unfortunate tendency, and I'm not accusing the media. I, it, it, it just happens to be that way. When we think of America, we always look at the White House. We always think of the White House. We think of uh, the person who is the current president. Now, the fact is the United States of America is a lot more than just the White House. There are 50 governors. California, if it were in the EU, would be one of the largest and most successful EU member countries in terms of size and, and economic productivity, etc., etc. So let's not ignore the fact that there are a hundred uh, senators, there are 50 governors, there is an enormous uh, network of business connections that, 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 that uh, links us uh, together, the United States and, and Europe, and in particular Germany. So um, there will be, I think, no return to the kind of, you know, traditional uh, relationship where the United States as the, as the benign hegemon covered for Europe for half a century. I think those times are going to be over, but I think we can return to a trustful, uh, operational, close relationship that has always been the, the trademark of uh, the rate of relationship between the EU, European powers like Germany, France, the UK and others, and the United States. And I think that's possible. With and without President Trump? Well, uh, I hope also with President Trump, uh, uh, there are areas where we can work quite well with President Trump, but there are unfortunately many areas where we have currently serious disagreements. Let's not ignore that. And uh, we'll have to work our way through that. This is an election year for the United States, election years, always tend to increase polarizing effects. So uh, let's not, you know, take, uh, let's not take every word that's spoken in an election campaign too seriously. Let's see what comes out next uh, in November and let's take it from there. I, I, remain, uh, I, I remain optimistic about the, the future of the transatlantic relationship, but in, in a different way and with greater responsibility and more burden sharing and more self-confidence of, uh, of Europe as a partner and of the European member countries as partners of the US in global affairs. 
What kind of partner in the White House, uh, uh, excuse my focus on the White House, but would a uh, potential President Biden be? Uh, uh, a less comfortable one, uh, a less difficult partner, you think? Well, you know, let, 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 me, let me just say that I was extremely happy uh, as in, in my role as the chairperson uh, of the Munich Security Conference when for the first time in, in the 60 year, uh, almost 60 year history of the Munich Security Conference in 2009, after the Obama election, uh, then Vice President Biden, newly elected Vice President Biden, uh, came to Munich. It was the first time an American Vice President uh, had come to Munich and, and spoken. This was the moment when the um, uh, reset button was pushed regarding the relationship between the United States and, uh, and, and Russia. So these were very optimistic moments. Um, we've been working well with Vice President Biden. We've also had uh, Vice President Pence twice in, in, uh, in Munich uh, in, in the last uh, couple of years. I think that we could, we Europeans and we Germans could work very easily with Vice President Biden, who was a long-term member of the Foreign Relations Committee of the U.S. Senate, who knows the issues extremely well. He will not need a long time to, if, if elected, to, um, uh, to work uh, in, on detailed issues with Europeans. Uh, 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 he knows the issues. What does it mean or what does it tell us actually that those worst hit by this crisis are actually precisely the members of the of the Western Alliance. If you look uh, around the world, we, we talked about China, uh, uh, but if you look at the current situation, it is uh, uh, it is awfully uh, uh, critical and magical in some European countries. Uh, uh, the French um, noticed a certain um, well, they got real about their uh, the capacities of their health system. Uh, look at Italy. Look at Spain. Uh, look at the United Kingdom also. Um, and of course, the United States. Is there something to be said about uh, about why these Western democracies um, suffer uh, that much? Well, I think you 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 touch on a on, on a very sensitive but very important point. Yes, it is true. Those the countries most seriously affected with the highest death rates, etc., happen to be, unfortunately, countries that uh, are part of the Western community, liberal, modern democracies. Uh, so this gives us some, uh, some need to reflect on what, if anything, went wrong. Uh, where should we look? What might be the models? Well, let me make two points. First, it is, of course, totally wrong to argue that authoritarian countries can handle this better than these uh, lazy liberal democracies. I think that is obviously wrong. South Korea is not an authoritarian state. New Zealand is not an authoritarian state. They handled this uh, really quite well. I think what, what our problem here in Europe has been is that not only on health, but also you know on military threats and, and other uh, threats, we have tended over the last couple of decades to devise our priorities in a way that, that, that we assumed that there would always be a fair weather and no rain and no thunder. Um, that was actually true with the way the Euro was constructed. Uh, no one predicted when it was constructed that we, we could end up with the kind of crisis that we started to have a decade ago. And in the same way, uh, our leaders, when they uh, negotiated the Lisbon Treaty, uh, decided not to include health in the kinds of competences for the European Union, for the EU Commission. I think that this gives us cause to reflect about the competences. And I, I, would, I would hope that as we go forward in the way that Chancellor Merkel described it yesterday, we would really think very hard about how to make sure that if we want a foreign policy of the European Union that can respond to all types of challenges, you cannot leave out, for example, energy security or health security 
all for that matter, climate security. Now, climate security is included in the brief for, for the EU Commission. But uh, the way forward, therefore, is not to go back into national solutions. As Chancellor Merkel uh, also has said yesterday, and I'm, great, I'm grateful to her for, for making the point, national, national solutions are not the way forward. We need to get our act together as the European Union. So creating a competence uh, for the European Union in pandemic uh, prevention, in coordination of measures, which, which was very difficult to do in, in, in March and April uh, for the member states, that is, I think, the kind of uh, lessons learned process that we need to go through. Now, economically, talking about uh, the, the lessons learned and talking about uh, European um, um, assertiveness in, in and after this crisis, also vis-a-vis -vis partners, um, uh, some, some worry and warrant that China's recovery, economic recovery, I mean, um, is going to be faster because the country uh, is, of course, uh, uh, set to be a tad, a tad more ruthless, let me say, uh, in, in, uh, in making sure its interests are uh, respected. Is there, do you think uh, it's time for, uh, for Europe um, to be more, uh, as I said, assertive uh, and to be more uh, active on, for example, uh, things like trade defense, which is also uh, kind of mentioned in the, in the Franco-German uh, uh, brief, uh, as you call it yesterday, when we talk about the creation of so-called European champions. Is there something you would subscribe to? Well, uh, well thanks for that question. Absolutely. I, uh, I, I think the, 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 it, is, it is absolutely correct to look at the way that we, the European Union, have handled competition issues, cartel issues, was to look at the situation inside the European Union. Uh, I think we need to take a more global view. If in the jungle around us, uh, everybody favors, uh, you know, large champions, China, the United States, and others, uh, we need to change the priorities, priorities of our own competition policy and allow uh, the creation of uh, companies that can effectively and successfully compete in, uh, with, with, with competitors from these other parts of the world, uh, which are not encumbered by uh, competition policy that is too restrictive. So that is really one area where uh, uh, we saw yesterday agreement going far beyond the recovery program, agreement between France and Germany, and I think this is something that needs to be addressed if we want the European Union to be a competitive actor, uh, uh, capable of protecting jobs uh, and competing successfully in high-tech areas, uh, in, the, in, the, in the evolving uh, technological challenges that uh, we're facing. Let me add, Florian, you know, among the many sponsors that we have in the, in the European, uh, in, in the Munich Security Conference, we have a number of, uh, you know, American high-tech companies like Microsoft and Facebook and, and Google, etc. But we also have traditional companies that produce, for example, automobiles like, uh, like BMW, uh, etc. Uh, and smaller uh, German companies, high companies that compete well in their specific markets, but they are all facing increasing competition from very, very large global competitors. So European competition policy needs to open up. Absolutely. We'll have a, a very few minutes left. Let me, uh, before we wrap up, let me ask you uh, a few last questions. For example, on uh, uh, coming back to, to, to write that, what, who do you think, uh, no, who do you think that the German uh, EU presidency, that as we, as we talked about before, will start in a, in a very few weeks only, will make that a priority and a focus? Uh, it was supposed to be um, uh, a focus on China, for example, with Chancellor American, Merkel hoping to host the whole, uh, uh, whole uh, uh, fully-fledged summit uh, with Chinese and European leadership. Um, uh, is that, uh, do you think, uh, you think still going to happen, uh, not physically, but is China and, and Europe's place in the world and geopolitics uh, still being a priority or are we totally overwhelmed by crisis response? 
Well, I guess you're asking the question, is the EU capable of walking and chewing gum at the same time? Can we deal with two or more issues simultaneously? I think we must. And of course, for obvious reasons, the, uh, uh, the strategy that uh, my friends and colleagues in the German government had prepared for the presidency uh, needs to be adapted significantly. The, the overriding priority now has to be the pandemic and the fallout um, and the economic recovery, etc. That's going to dominate, as far as I can tell, uh, the, the agenda of the second half of this year and probably far beyond. But having said that, I would think that we must absolutely not lose sight of other important issues, including climate. That was also one of the important uh, drivers of the uh, upcoming uh, German presidency and including China. Yes, uh, if America believes that the relationship with China is a zero sum game where it's either America wins or China wins and nothing in between. Uh, our European view has got to be a slightly different view. Our view has got to be, can we create a level playing field where uh, rules exist uh, that are binding for, for both sides? Uh, can we have uh, you know, a positive uh, agenda with China. That is what Chancellor Merkel wanted to um, uh, to put um, uh, to put together in Leipzig in September with a large investment conference. I'm still hoping that uh, in some shape or form this uh, this attempt can go forward. Um, and I think we need, uh, and that would be my strategic wish. We need something that deserves to be called a European Union strategy on China, which we don't have at this moment. We have a German China policy, we have a French China policy, we have uh, everybody's uh, own China policy, but nothing that deserves to be called a European Union strategic approach to China. There are good attempts by the EU Commission, but that needs to be pulled together into a strategic approach. And that I think is um, the important uh, challenge for the next six months and of course far beyond. Won't be over by December, but it needs to be started now. There's people uh, saying that uh, uh, I'm asking you as a fellow, as a fellow German, we two Germans here uh, speaking in English, of course, uh, there's people who say that German is, is the language you, uh, you have to speak if you want to get things done in Europe at the moment uh, with Brexit on the one hand, and probably on a, on a smaller scale also uh, with uh, leadership in, in Brussels, uh, partly being in German, hand, in German hands with uh, Ursula von der Leyen. Uh, is that something you would, uh, you would agree with? Is, German, is the, the importance of the German language growing after Brexit? Well, I'm not so sure that's really true. I mean, look, uh, you and I, uh, for very good reasons, we conduct this conversation not in German, but in English, because uh, the outreach is so much more important. I published a book a, a year or two ago in, in German, and now I'm hoping that by the early autumn we'll have an English version finally, because that would hopefully attract, uh, you know, a lot more uh, more interest and, and, and more readers. No, I, uh, I welcome the fact that Germany plays uh, a constructive and important role in, in matters European. That's good and that's welcome. And the pro-European spirit, which is fortunately present in, in, in Germany, in, in the population among the voters, is of course something that we can build on. But um, I think we've all gotten used to the fact that the lingua franca of Europe and of the European Union is English, regardless of whether the United Kingdom is a member or not. A very last question for you. As the chairman of the Munich Security Conference, uh, we haven't had any physical meetings over the past two months. Uh, the German presidency uh, uh, reckons that only after the summer uh, reality physical meetings can start again uh, now the Munich Security Conference uh, is always uh, early early in the year 
uh, and its charm uh, to its charm uh, now, what, what contributes to its charm is of course that is a it's a rather cozy affair in Munich uh, can you uh, give us a forecast a prediction uh, or do you know already uh, how and in which form uh, the next Munich Security Conference in 2021 is going to take place well as you know as as Yogi Berra famous American philosopher said uh, one should never make predictions, especially not about the future. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's difficult for me to, uh, to forecast what the situation will be toward the end of this year or in, uh, in early 2021. Let me, only, uh, let me only, only express the hope that we will be able to have a meaningful Munich Security Conference with physical participation uh, in February of next year. Whether we can have, you know, a thousand people in this hotel, uh, as has been customary, or whether we will have to thin it out a bit to uh, to to, to um, uh, uh, fulfill uh, possibly still existing health requirements by early next year, we'll see about that. But it is my firm intention to uh, to work very hard to make sure that uh, by February of next year, we will not be condemned to having a Munich security conference by video or by Zoom, uh, but uh, a, a real conference uh, with how many participants and what kinds of rules uh, we'll see. We were really extremely lucky this year because the conference took place without spreading the virus. Uh, we have not, I've not heard of anyone who has argued that he caught the virus by participating in Munich. So we were really lucky. Uh, uh, and I hope that by next year, we can have another uh, Munich security conference. I know our, many of our sponsors and partners uh, cross their fingers with us uh, and we'll, we'll do our best to make sure that it can happen. And so do we, crossing our fingers. Uh, Ambassador Ishinger, Wolfgang, many thanks for uh, this conversation. Uh, it was a pleasure and it was very interesting. Uh, uh, we covered a lot of ground from uh, Franco-German relations to EU affairs to foreign policy, security policy. Thank you all, uh, our viewers, our audience. Um, I'm afraid we didn't get to all your questions, but I think we, uh, we covered a lot of them and we covered, as I said, uh, a lot of ground. If you want to give us feedback, as I said at the beginning, please do so and write an email to events at political.eu. That would be much appreciated and much welcome. Uh, and one last thing, uh, uh, there's more virtual events for now. Uh, we're bound to uh, virtual events, actually, uh, at Politico uh, to come. The next up that we know already uh, is called Managing Chronic Diseases in Times of Corona and is happening next uh, week on May 27th. So thank you to all of you. Thanks again. Uh, uh, and großes Dankeschön, Ambassador Ischinger. Uh, and uh, see you very soon. Thank you very much, Florian. Thank you all. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Bye-bye. Thank you.